Hey kids, wow, you made it to video number five. I'm so proud. Last time we talked about the executive branch and what it does. This time we're looking at the judicial branch and the Bill of Rights. This is going to be epic. So grab your favorite book and read the last chapter because after today, you may never want to read that book again. I'm not really sure why, but you may, I mean, it could happen. You may never want to read it again. So you better read the last chapter so you don't forget what happened at the end. Essential question. What is the role of the judicial branch and what changes have been made to the Constitution since it was written? So what is the judicial branch and what does it do? Well, I'm afraid to say I was wrong about the judo thing. They have nothing to do with the martial arts. What the judicial branch really does is decide if the laws passed by the legislative branch are constitutional and make sure that the executive branch carries out the laws fairly. So let's find out how the judicial branch actually does this. The federal court system decides cases for people arrested for federal crimes, settles lawsuits between states and against the U.S., and hears lawsuits that require the interpretation of the Constitution. Now, what do I mean by interpretation of the Constitution? Well, does freedom of speech mean you can say whatever you want to? No, you can't. You can't say things that cause physical harm to others, like causing a panic, yelling fire at a crowded theater. Students can't say whatever they want to in school that might disrupt the learning environment. And there are many other restrictions as well. It is the federal court system, and more specifically the Supreme Court, that has the final say on what exactly freedom of speech means and what it doesn't mean. The Supreme Court is only one of three levels of federal courts in the judicial branch. So let's explore these levels and see what they do. The first level of courts are the district courts. There are 94 federal district courts spread out across the U.S. and elsewhere, each of which is in charge of deciding cases in their district or the area around them. Federal district courts consist of a judge, jury members, lawyers, and defendants. The defendant is the person in trouble. Now, the defendant has a lawyer or team of lawyers that defend him or her. There are other lawyers who are in charge of trying to prove the defendants are guilty. These lawyers are called prosecutors. The judge is in charge of making sure that the lawyers are following the rules and playing fair. The jury members are the people who, after listening to the lawyers and getting instructions from the judge, make a decision of whether or not the defendant is guilty or innocent. Sometimes a defendant who loses in district court feels like they did not get a fair trial. Maybe evidence was missed, or they had a misinformed jury, or some other reason for being found guilty when they were not. If they can prove any of these things to be true, they might be able to get another chance to prove they are innocent at a second level of federal courts known as the appellate court. Notice the root word appeal. Well, if you had an A. But still, it's there because when you go to the appellate court, it means you're asking them to reconsider their first decision. There are 13 appellate courts across the U.S. In an appellate court, the defendant's lawyer submits the reasons in writing as to why they think you didn't get a fair trial in the first place. In appellate court, there is no jury, but instead a panel of three judges who listen to the lawyers from each side, read the written arguments, and then decide if there should be another trial, a decision reversed, or if the first decision stands. If the defendant loses at the appellate level, they can ask for their case to be appealed one more level, the third and final level level of the U.S. court system known as the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is actually a panel of nine judges who decide which cases they will hear and which cases they will ignore. If they choose a case, it is usually because the meaning of the Constitution needs to be interpreted. The Supreme Court only listens to a handful of cases from the thousands that ask every year. If the Supreme Court refuses to hear your case, or if they hear it and don't overturn the lower court's decision, then you are out of options. Their say, or lack of, is the final word in the decision for your trial. The Supreme Court has made very important decisions in our history, like Roe v. Wade, which made abortion legal, Brown v. Board of Education, which ended segregation in schools, the Dred Scott case, which helped lead the Civil War, and most recently when the Supreme Court upheld Obamacare as constitutional. These important cases never would have happened without the first major decision the court made that unexpectedly increased the power of the Supreme Court a great deal. Marbury v. Madison is seen as the first major decision the Supreme Court made because the ruling created what is now known as judicial review. When John Adams was about to leave the presidency after losing to Thomas Jefferson, his political party, the Federalists, were about to lose their power not only in the executive branch, but also in the legislative branch. Jefferson's party, the Democratic Republicans, had just beaten them across the country in many races for Congress. Between the time that the Federalists lost these elections and them actually leaving office, 
Adams wanted to make sure the Federals still had power in the judicial branch. So with the help of fellow Federalists who were about to leave Congress, they passed what was known as the Judicial Act. This act called for more judges to be put in place across the nation that Adams could appoint to be Federalists. Because this was all done last minute, all the paperwork was not done in time when Jefferson became president and appointed his new cabinet, including the Secretary of State, James Madison. Madison did not like that Adams and the Federalists tried to pack the judicial branch full of Federalists, so he refused to finish the paperwork needed to put these judges in place. William Marbury was one of the judges who did not get his paperwork and therefore could not start his job as judge. He decided to sue Madison and took his case directly to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided to hear the case, and after the arguments for both sides were made, they made their decision. Their decision was that, yes, the paperwork should have been done and delivered, but since the law that created the new judges was unconstitutional, it didn't matter. The entire law was overturned by the Supreme Court, making all the new federal judges lose their jobs. Since that ruling, the Supreme Court has had the power to overturn laws it deems as unconstitutional, or breaking the law of the Constitution. The interesting thing about judicial review is that the court system can take no action until someone in the country decides to start a lawsuit. In other words, if the people of the United States don't know their rights and let the government take away their rights, the Supreme Court, or anyone else for that matter, will not save them for us. We as citizens have to take the first step to challenge laws that take our rights away, or we will lose those rights. The main list of rights we are guaranteed are found in the first ten amendments of the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights lists the following protections for citizens of the United States. So freedom of speech, press, religion, and petition. There's the freedom to express your opinion, the freedom of the press to print the news, or tell the news on the television without the government intervening. Freedom of religion is the right to practice or go to whatever church you'd like to. And petition is the right to call upon the government to make changes in an organized and written fashion. The right to keep and bear arms means that citizens have the right to own guns. Conditions for quartering soldiers means that the government cannot require citizens to house soldiers like they did before the Revolutionary War. The right of search and seizure means that must have warrants and reasons to search property. Provisions concerning prosecution, this protects you from self-incrimination, meaning that you cannot be forced and your spouse cannot be forced to testify against you in court. Right to a speedy trial, witnesses, etc. That means that you have the right to a trial as quickly as possible after you've been arrested. They couldn't just throw you in jail and say you'll get a trial in 10 years. Right to a trial by jury, this means that regular people would be the people deciding whether you're guilty or innocent not a judge. Excessive bail, cruel punishment. This is the freedom from cruel and unusual punishment. It states that all punishments must fit the crime. Rules of construction of the Constitution. They wanted to make sure that they didn't take the rights that were listed and say these are your only rights. So basically it just says these are not the only rights. They're just the ones that we thought were most important. And finally, rights of the states. It says whatever our the Constitution does not give to the federal government remains with the states. As you can see, these are all pretty important rights that we would never want to give up. But remember, none of these rights are absolute, as a speedy trial doesn't mean you get a trial the day of your arrest, or that the right to keep and bear arms doesn't mean you get a howitzer in your backyard. The Supreme Court decides what each of these rights actually mean and what protections we actually have. Now, there have been more than 10 amendments to the Constitution. In fact, there have been 27. Let's take a quick look at some of these important additions and changes to the Constitution besides the Bill of Rights. The 13th Amendment, ratified almost immediately after the Civil War, abolished slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment made the citizenship of former slaves part of the Constitution. The 15th Amendment made it unconstitutional to restrict voting based on race. Together, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment are referred to as the Civil War Amendments. The 16th Amendment allows for federal income tax. We may hate it, but this is how the massive machine that our government is gets paid for. The 17th Amendment, United States Senators used to be selected by state legislatures. This amendment elects them directly by the vote of the people. The 19th Amendment makes it unconstitutional to restrict voting based on gender. Giving women the right to vote took until 1920, 50 years after African Americans got to vote. The 22nd Amendment, ratified in 1951 as a response to Franklin Delano Roosevelt being elected four times. This amendment restricts the president to two terms in office. The 26th Amendment, in 1971, the voting age was dropped to 18, immediately causing millions of young Americans to ignore it. So what? Well, if you can answer the following questions, then you'll learn, learn, learn what you need to know. What are the three levels of courts in the federal court system, and what does each one do? What impact did Marbury versus Madison have on the power of the Supreme Court? And finally, what do you think are the three most important amendments to the Constitution, and why do you think so? That's it for this unit. Hope you learned a lot.